Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See detail. I'm David Plotz, the CEO of CityCast, and today, back by popular demand, is another special episode of CityCast Denver, where we zoom out and discuss what the entire country is talking about. But before we get to that, I have to tell you something really important. If you're new here, or even if you're a longtime listener, you might not know that CityCast Denver is supported in part by members. Our daily podcast and newsletter are completely free for anyone in our community, but that's only possible with member support. So all week, we're asking you to consider becoming a member to support our daily CityCast Denver podcast and the Hey Denver newsletter that you know and love. If Bree, Paul, Olivia, or Peyton ever helped you to understand a local issue, hosted a guest you loved hearing from, or introduced you to the best of what's happening around town, now is the time to show your support. I love listening to CityCast Denver. One of my favorite episodes was a few weeks ago when Paul and Bree talked about the 12 big ideas to fix downtown. They talked about the vacancy tax. They had public toilets and a whole bunch of other fascinating ideas. They also had a great episode with a state senator recently after her own car was towed by the very same predatory towing company she was trying to protect Denverites from. It is just a great podcast. So again, joining our member community is the best way to support CityCast Denver. With your small monthly contribution, we'll get to stick around for years to come. Plus, anyone who signs up gets access to our podcast ad-free. Just visit membership.citycast.fm to become a member today. That's membership.citycast.fm. Now, on with the show. So here we are. Literally, here are a bunch of hosts again. Hello, guys. Hey, David. Hey. 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 Hey, hey, hey. And they're here to tell me the story from their hometown that you absolutely need to hear about this fall. From the insane Trump lies about gangs, lies that are tearing apart a Denver suburb, to Nashville's ambitious plan to rein in binge drinking, to a controversial effort to bring high-speed rail to Las Vegas, and much more. So let us head out on a whirlwind tour of the United States. Let's go to Denver Hello, Bree Davies, host of CityCast Denver. Hey, boss. How's it going? It's good. Better than apparently it is in Aurora, where there's a <laughs> Venezuelan gang that has taken over the city, from what it's, I hear. Oh, it's wild. It is wild and how inaccurate that is. And I have to say, we normally really don't talk about Trump on our show um, unless it is directly related to us. And unfortunately, we've been having to talk about him a lot because of this situation. So ever since the presidential debate on September 10th, Trump has like been threatening to come to Aurora, Colorado, and he's been spreading lies. Aurora is a Denver suburb, right? Yeah. I'll give a little background on Aurora in just a sec for folks who don't know. But he's been spreading these lies that are related to our Venezuelan newcomer situation. And he says the entire city has been taken over by the Tren de Aragua gang, a prison gang from Venezuela. And just for reference, in the last two years, Colorado has welcomed over 40,000 newcomers from Venezuela. So Aurora, again, is I, I guess it's a Denver suburb. It's right next to us. It's part of the Denver metro area, but it is the third largest city in the state. And while Denver is a sanctuary city, we're very open about it. Aurora is very open about being a non-sanctuary city. It's the most diverse city in Colorado. There's dozens of languages spoken here there's a ton of newcomers serving organizations already existing here, but their mayor, Mike Kaufman, is a Republican, and he's been very clear that they are not a sanctuary city. So the gang hysteria started over the summer. Um, on July 28th, there was this election in Venezuela for a president, and a lot of the newcomers in Aurora sort of gathered in a parking lot to celebrate because they thought that the opposition, Edmundo Gonzalez, was going to win. Uh, Maduro, unfortunately, just decided he had won. And it led to like a big party. And there was some minor issues, but nobody really got hurt. Nothing really happened. And this Aurora council person, Danielle Jarinski, just went to social media and lied. She was like, there's a riot. These Venezuelans are going insane. We have to protect our city. It was just totally bonkers. 
their mayor was starting to parrot this information. And so it, it sort of started this wave of hysteria. Fast forward a couple months and the city of Aurora is threatening to shut down an apartment complex because of health code violations. There's like rat infestation, trash is not getting picked up, all of these issues. And the residents there were saying, yes, this is real. These health issues are real. We are rent paying tenants and our land, our property managers have abandoned our building. Well, the property management company came out and said, well, we abandoned it because a Venezuelan gang has taken it over. And we cannot send people there to take care of it because it's too dangerous. And none of this was true. And so it just kind of snowballed into this situation where we have folks who are here. They were living and paying for housing. They were working and they were living in untenable conditions. And this out-of-state management company turned it into this hysteria around the gang situation. And that's kind of what Trump picked up on. It's not to say that none of it is true. There are there has been a presence of Trende Aragua in Aurora, but it's not to the extent that these council people and their mayor at one point was parroting on Fox News. So that's what made Trump so interested in Aurora, Colorado. Wait, so besides these fantastical mythological stories that have been spread, are there issues with the Venezuelan migrants that Coloradans broadly are concerned about? I would not say anything out of the ordinary of any other crime in the state or the city. Nothing different. They are part of the population. The Aurora Police Department has come out themselves and said, yes, we are monitoring gang activity, but it is nothing outside of the ordinary of any other gang monitoring we do here in the city, whether Venezuelans are here or not. This is Sarah in Las Vegas. Can I jump in with a quick comment? Yeah. Mostly the comment is, I am so over xenophobia, you guys. Like, <laughs> it's so 19th century. Like, I'm sick of it because, okay, first of all, statistically, people who have immigrated or migrated to this country, they do crime at a far lower rate than people who are born in this country. So this type of scapegoating, it's just been a political fear-mongering move for so long. And, you know, now I'm podcast host Las Vegas, but I think many of you know I'm from Ohio and also I'm a food historian. And so, like, I've really been seeing what's going on in Springfield, Ohio with the same sort of alarmist claims, yeah. like words have meaning and how the Haitian community and the whole community of Springfield has been targeted by bomb threats after Trump said in the presidential debates the Haitians are eating cats and dogs, which is out of the xenophobic fascist playbook of the 19th century. The same things were said about immigrants then. Yeah. It's election year. That's I think that's a big part of it. This episode is brought to you by Pine Melon. As the weather cools down, Pine Melon has everything you need to embrace fall. From peak season produce like apples, squash, and pears, to seasonal decor like gourds and pumpkins, they've got you covered year round. Pine Melon proudly partners with over 200 local farmers, ranchers, and producers across Colorado, delivering fresh, high quality meats, baked goods, pantry staples, and more right to your door. No subscription needed. And that means you have access to same-day delivery in Denver and Boulder within a two-hour window. Go to pinemelon.com to order locally sourced food today. Customers can use the code CityCastDenver at checkout for $35 off your first order of $75 or more. Join the movement today and support local makers and farmers at pinemelon.com. That's pinemelon.com. Let's go to a very different kind of subject in Portland, Oregon. CityCast Portland host Claudia Meza is here to talk to us about national sports. And Claudia is very excited to welcome new national sports to Portland. You know, normally, no, I'll be honest. I am, but I'm not. Well, also whiplash. But here, I wanted to talk about how a couple of weeks ago, Portland landed the latest WNBA franchise expansion team. And it's huge for our city because Portland. Thank you. Thank you. Portland really just loves women's sports. Also, we really need the good press and the economic boost that it'll hopefully bring. But really, just like as a city, it was embarrassing for us that we didn't have a WNBA team. Um, I don't know if you at all follow women's soccer, but the Portland Thorns are, they're just, the, the, the attendance of those games are historic. Like it eclipses even some of like men's soccer matches like in other cities. So no other city comes close to 
you know, women's soccer fan support. And this is what is expected to happen with our new WNBA team when it will launch in 2026. And I totally think it will because kind of like what I was coming, like, I hate basketball. I'll be very honest. It's like, they're so tall. The hoop is so close. (laughs) Is it a sport if it's like 150 points? Like, is it? 150 points in one game? These are nonsense questions. What is, it, what, is, yeah, wait, like, what? Girl, what is going on? What we is she talking about? We love our Golden Nuggets in Vegas. I'm it's saying, so is fun. It a sport? This is wild. If, if, if every game you're like, oh, here's a thousand points. I'm just you're saying. You're going to be converted. You're going to be converted. I've never had so much fun as a WNBA game. We're careening. Just, just so you know, this is a Portland Newsflash, City cast special. Claudia hates tall people. Put it out yeah. there. <laughs> you know Heard what? in Madison. Not that far. <laughs> what do you, what, Claudia? What do you want to name the franchise? Does it have a name? Well, the new WNBA franchise. Of, of course, that's all that anybody is talking about. I've already pitched on the show a, a handful of times uh, the Portland Bad Bridges because I think oh, it nice. would. <laughs> right? I do like that. And like every game, there would be because we have so many bridges. We'd have like a new bridge mascot, and it would be all like you know, like you know, big lashes. <laughs> Maybe a little Megan the Stallion playing, just a bad bridge. We had a joke through. about this. We had we when we were talking about a bridge, it was she's a bad bridge in the streets. She's a structurally unsound bridge in the sheets. So <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> That's good. You know how they always like kind of play off the men's team. So I don't know. Hopefully, it's not like the Portland Pioneer women or something like that. Um, but don't I, okay. you guys doesn't Portland have the women's sports bar, the sports bra too, which is the greatest named. Mm. Right? Sports bar in the world. Yeah, I, I do want to say yes, but also just so you know, uh, Portland puns are like Bob's level. Like we have so many punny names and it's become like a thing. Like if you start a business, you have to hit that bar. So sports bra, it was at one point the only all women's sports bar. Like basically you go in and they only play all women's sports uh, since I think it opened like a few years ago. And now it's becoming a franchise because Serena Williams' husband – whose name I don't know. Alexis uh, Ohanian. Okay. He's coming through (laughs) and he is like just making a whole franchise. And that's actually a big reason why we're getting this WNBA team because they had the chairwoman from, uh, you know, the WNBA. They had her in the sports bra and she just was like, oh, I get it. Portland, you need a team. It's embarrassing. But I mean, can I just also just quickly say that we might also get an MLB team, and that's what I'm actually very excited about. Very excited about WNBA team. I'm not saying I'm not, but I'm just like MLB team would be sick. That is all. Let's revisit. Take our A's. Take the Las Vegas A's. We were in the short list for that, but Sarah, I'm. I gotta tell you, I'm actually kind of excited we didn't get them because y'all are gonna need so much sage for that team. The fact that you didn't even <laughs> rename them. The Las Vegas A's, also Oakland. I feel like Oakland and Portland need to stick together. We're like little sibling sister city. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, no, no. Uh, good luck with the uh, Las Vegas A's. We don't want them. <laughs> You've already heard from David Figler and Sarah Lohman, who are the hosts of CityCast Las Vegas. So David and Sarah, you've got high-speed rail coming to Vegas. That is Com- seems, coming. Yeah. Seems exciting. Oh, it's super exciting. Yeah, we're about to have the first high speed rail in the country, the first high speed train. Um, it's going to connect Las Vegas with LA. Okay. Technically, it's going to connect Las Vegas with Rancho Cucamonga, which is a suburb about 40 miles east of downtown L.A. But we're stoked because this is a super common commute between our two cities for both work and leisure. And this train is going to go at least 186 miles per hour. And that will turn like a four to five hour drive without traffic into an easy two and a half ish hour train ride. And we've already had a groundbreaking ceremony. So everything is going Totally great and smooth. Right, David? Uh, Well, Sarah, it does depend on who you ask. Uh, According to Brightline personnel, Nevada elected officials, and even Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg, it's awesome, amazing, everything's great. And on the other hand, CityCast Las Vegas did some digging, and it might not be so rosy. Uh, We had talked with two different members of the Nevada High Speed Rail Authority, and they had some concerns about the lack of oversight, confusion over the actual route, and safety for passengers, workers, and the general public. You know, 
all that. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are also general concerns about uh, fatal tragedies surrounding rail operations with Brightline in Florida, that this is a new technology. Some experts say that the accidents in Florida were preventable with more proactive measures. Yeah, so 97 people were struck by Brightline trains and killed in Florida since 2017. However, Brightline was not found to be directly at fault in those deaths. And the Las Vegas to L.A. route wouldn't have as many intersections with roadways and pedestrian crossings. But word on the street is they did this big groundbreaking and they didn't even have all the funding in place to get started. So, David, did you hear has like the project started construction after the groundbreaking? Like this thing is supposed to launch in 2028 in time for the Summer Olympics in L.A. Yeah, construction has not actually started. They're still doing boring and things of that nature, geological testing. And Brightline, again, the company that got the franchise, got a big boost from a government package of funding uh, to the tune of $6 billion. But the company is still about, checking notes, $6 billion short. Uh, We had reached out to U.S. Senator Jackie Rosen, who publicly said at that groundbreaking that funding was complete and everything was ready to go. And then her office backtracked when we pressed her. Brightline itself has been very evasive when we asked them directly how far they were still away from their goal of financing. Yeah, Jackie Rosen is one of our Nevada senators, by the way. And I got to say, like, I am excited. I am like such a train girly. I'd much rather just eat snacks and nap instead of sitting in traffic at state line. And I really want this project to happen, but it feels really messy. So I don't know. We're just going to keep updating this story because, um, I mean, a couple other of our city cast cities also have potential high-speed rail projects. Like, there's supposed to be a line that goes Chicago to Cleveland to Pittsburgh to Philly to NYC, and I'd also love to see that happen, too. To me, the obvious question here is, why are they ending it at Rancho Cucamonga besides so that people make jokes about it? I mean, it doesn't... If you're going to have a high-speed rail line to L.A., why don't you have a high-speed rail line to L.A.? It's always been the routing, David, and uh, initially it was Victorville. So this is like a victory that it's all the way to Rancho Cucamonga. The idea is that you would pick up the regular rail, the conventional yeah, rail the that's already in place, the train from Rancho Cucamonga into L.A., which is another hour and change on that ride. But I think between cost and routing, uh, it, it only made sense for this particular project to go that far. Although, yeah, it raises a lot of eyebrows Uh, which are on top of rolled eyes to a lot of us here that Rancho Cucamonga would be the terminus of the high-speed rail. I'm just sitting over here mourning. I don't know if any of you guys remember, but Wisconsin was uh, supposed to get a high-speed rail from Minneapolis to Madison to Chicago. And the federal government had $800 million that they were contributing to it. Like it was like a knockout plan. So this is just bringing up all of the political turmoil that comes in around these sorts of things. And it was derailed, truly. Uh, There is a great WPR podcast that you should check out about the whole process. But things were were already set in motion. We bought the trains and the train company is like, uh, these are yours. Like we have a contract. And we so we basically ended up holding the bag in this huge mess. No. Um, so people are still pretty furious that that didn't happen. You just heard there, Bianca Martin, host of CityCast Madison. And let's go to Madison. Bianca, when I got to visit you in Madison last year, I noticed that you had a large university, University of Wisconsin, one of the great institutions of of higher learning in this country. And you want to talk about the impact that the recent Supreme Court affirmative action ruling has had on the university. So what's happened there? Yeah, yeah. I know last time we did this all host, I was talking about UW and the positives of our efforts to be like a leader on AI. Um, Unfortunately, a little sad news this time around. UW-Madison's freshman class this year has declined in racial diversity. And this is an issue that is a national issue that lots of folks are grappling with. So I'm I'm really curious about what you're seeing in other places. But for UW-Madison, our flagship university, last year was the most diverse freshman class in the school's history. And we've been on that upward trend for the past like five years. UW-Madison's Chancellor Jennifer Mnookin put out a statement when affirmative action was overturned, saying that we had seen a roughly 50% increase in our underrepresented undergraduate student population in the past five years. And this year, we've had the inverse. So 
It's pretty upsetting to see uh, Manukin has already said that she's disappointed and the university is still committed to those communities. Um, and other I've saw reporting from other uh, new freshmen coming that, oh my goodness, I didn't realize this was the case. I've got some of the numbers um, from local Cap Times reporting. UW data was released a couple weeks ago. Black, Indigenous, and Hispanic enrollment is down and white enrollment is up. So the percentage of underrepresented students of color enrolled in the first year class decreased from 18% last year to 14.3% this fall. So I want to caution against drawing huge conclusions before I finish, because this is an extremely complex issue, right, across schools in the U.S. There's a range of data. This is what's happening at UW. Also, the percentage of Asian students, international students, remain the same. The numbers don't include folks who select two races like me, who would be, you know, black and white. That is around four to five percent. And the white population rose from 58 percent last year to 60. So so we're nothing like MIT, which, according to the Chronicle of Higher Education, they plummeted this freshman class. It's 36 percent on racial diversity. And they've said openly the U.S. Supreme Court's decision to bar race conscious admissions has hurt their ability to attract and enroll students from underrepresented racial groups. One thing that I've also read about Bianca is at especially public universities, it's not simply that the classes are less diverse. It's also that universities either because they feel they have to or because they're running scared, have gotten rid of certain kinds of diversity programs or extracurriculars that might serve students of color in particular. Has that happened at Madison? Yeah, well, so Wisconsin has this, I'm going to say it's at least a a unique level of outcry from our GOP-controlled state legislature against DEI efforts in our university. Basically, the Speaker of the Assembly, Robin Voss, said, I am going to completely (laughs) eradicate DEI in our university system and was able to strong arm the UW system to sign off on cutting DEI programming. So actually, a lot of staff and programming that has explicit language that might be race based. Um, They've had to change their descriptions, change their job descriptions, explain their work a little differently. And the University of Wisconsin-Madison right now is under investigation by the U.S. Department of Education for allegations of discrimination because of its BIPOC Fellows Program. So a program that like gives $500 to uh, students that fall into that group and also mentorship because they're, they're saying that's discriminating against white students. So the university has really had to be on their toes. Hi, and welcome to Ikea. How can I help? Oh, my schedule is crazy. I just want some me time. Maybe it's time to embrace the joy of staying in. With comfortable beds, pillow and decor, mood lighting, and so much more, you can turn your bedroom into the place to be. Oh, sounds like a dream. We've got you. Visit us in-store or at ikea-usa.com slash sleep to create your dream bedroom today. Let's go to Philly. Trinanery host of CityCast Philly is here. Hello, Trené. Hey. So you want to talk about the neighborhood of Kensington and the huge controversy around efforts to to do what there? That's a good question. (laughs) So Philly's 100th mayor, Sherelle Parker, who also happens to be our first woman mayor, is trying something really novel to deal with drug use in the Kensington neighborhood. So I'm going to describe this neighborhood to you that is the reason why I'm talking about it. Imagine it's overrun by people using and selling opioids and increasingly a drug called Trank. The technical name is xylazine, which is actually an animal tranquilizer that calls like really bad wounds on your body. So Mayor Parker first decided to deploy the entire graduating class of police cadets to the neighborhood in a show of force. Now she's opening what is called a wellness court in the neighborhood. And the idea is that after police do sweeps to arrest people, they'll be brought in before a judge and offered treatment that very same day. 
However, there have been plenty of questions and actual hearings in City Hall about the effectiveness of all of this. Advocates worry that some people with open warrants will end up in jail and die from withdrawal symptoms. And that has happened to a woman named Amanda Cahill, um, 31 years old, was found days later dead in a cell. But given that cities across the country continue just to grapple with quality of life issues related to open drug use in neighborhoods like Kensington, this is something that we're all watching. What is the neighborhood like as a neighborhood? I mean, can people live there normally? Is there a huge population of people whose lives have been totally disrupted because there's a tremendous amount of drug use going on? Or is it a neighborhood where people can kind of go about their business? It's a little bit of both. Sometimes, you know, there's like this unspoken maybe often spoken um, stereotype about Kensington where you don't want to be there. It's not a good nightlife. There's not great places. And but there is a reality. There is a struggle. If you are trying to raise your family in this neighborhood, you might have to bypass people who are hunched over. However, there is also this really beautiful, thriving community of entrepreneurs um, and people who are fighting back and want to make this a successful, thriving and continuously thriving neighborhood. But it's a battle between council members in City Hall who want to take away some of the harm reduction programs that have helped folks dealing and battling with drug use. So it often gets labeled as a stereotypical bad neighborhood, but there is beauty in Kensington. Ternay, when I visited you in Philly, I was in Kensington and I was there and went to this incredible Vietnamese owned coffee shop where the whole community was there. I visited two black owned ice cream businesses, Cloud yes, Cups Cloud and Cups. Whimsical. <laughs> yeah, they're both in the, and it's just like Cloud Cups is just like a, it's an ice cream store for the family, for like for families to come in and bring their kids and just have some gelato. But then, yeah, you turn a corner and there'll be one street where there are people who are clearly suffering from addiction. So it's really important to remember just this is not to you this is everyone like addiction isn't a crime and this is a real neighborhood and people love their neighbors and do have empathy for those struggles as hard as it can be to also thrive in spaces like that all right now let's go to nashville to marie anderson from city cast nashville with a, a different kind of problem in the public space with also substance abuse in the public space so I think of binge drinking as being basically the economic driver of the city of Nashville, Ouch. Marie. Um, but it sounds like <laughs> thanks. It sounds We're like right that you all are trying Madison. to curb it. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask the group what is the first thing that comes to mind when you do think of Nashville. So David thinks music. binge drinking, music. Oh, music. music. Oh, that's nice. Not bachelorettes or Morgan Wallen. I just learned this recently that you're a bachelorette town. I had no. I only know it as music, and I learned that's your like biggest. The biggest yeah. draw there. I won't say Nash Vegas out loud. Oh, wait, I just. Oh, did. gosh. Yeah, we don't I know like you guys that. Hate that. Yeah. Although I did help plan my sister's bachelorette, Margo's uh, last rodeo, <laughs> and it was amazing. But we did a lot of binge drinking because that's where it's at. <laughs> so, yeah, Nashville, you know, we really, it's, I grew up here and I've just seen the change over the decades of how many people come to our town to drink. And guess what? They do it on these things called transportainment vehicles. Oh, my Which God. That's the term for those things? Transportainment vehicles. Oh, my Not the goodness. booze bus? Oh, we got the booze bus. Is we it a pedal bar? Pontoon saloon. <laughs> <laughs> so we have <laughs> pedal taverns. We have party buses. We have pickup trucks with hot tubs. We have tractors. We have tanks. Helicopters? No way. <laughs> uh, well, I'm sure that's coming in 2025. <laughs> but yeah, on the Cumberland River, it goes right downtown. We have the pontoon saloon and the cruising tiki bar, which I was hiking the other day. You wouldn't think that it would affect you on a hike. But I was hiking and all of a sudden I heard screaming and I turned to my right, looked through the trees and on the river was a tiki bar floating by with a bunch of drunk bachelorettes. So Beautiful. there are 80 <laughs> permits, 80 permits right now for these types of vehicles in Nashville and they're causing all kinds of ruckus. Of course, you would think traffic, it causes, my mom's friend was trying to go to a concert the other day, got stuck behind a pedal tavern and missed the concert. <laughs> she couldn't, she was 75. She couldn't figure out how to go around it. Um, you also can't bike also, while drunk. That's too much. Yeah. <laughs> too much to ask. 
<laughs> but also, I mean, some of these party buses uh, were going by a, a local high school. And so the teachers were having to teach over these drunk patrons. Um, and then also these drunk patrons are screaming obscenities at these young high school students as they go to school. And also, this is a na- made national news. Maybe you all heard. You know, obviously, a lot of college kids come to Nashville for fall break, spring break, all sorts. But um, Riley Strand, a 22-year-old University of Missouri student, came to Nashville with some fraternity brothers. They had been drinking. He got separated from them. He went missing for several days. And actually, according to surveillance footage, they saw him stumbling around all over downtown. And he actually fell into the river, which is very common for some of these drunk tourists. They fall into the Cumberland River And unfortunately, Riley Strand, he drowned. And then weeks later, another woman from New Jersey fell into the river. And so people come here to party. That's for sure. What is the city doing to curb this? Well, they're putting plexiglass on some of these transportation vehicles because a couple of years ago, a man fell out and was hit by a car and killed, uh, which that does curb some sound. The these vehicles are only allowed to operate between nine and eleven o'clock at night, and they're not allowed to drive between four and six during rush hour. They've put up a temporary fence, uh, just a chain link fence around the Cumberland. It looks beautiful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea this was keep, happening. Yeah, keep tourists from falling into the river. We also, I mean, some really amazing things are happening to keep our residents safe, but also our tourists. So we actually have a mayor's office of nightlife. So we have a night mayor. And that was created as to act as a liaison between Nashville's nightlife, metro government, residents, and visitors. And they have three major initiatives happening right now. And that's one, to educate bartenders um, on, you know, over-serving what it looks like, just educating them and giving them proper training. They're also distributing Narcans. There's a lot of drug overdosing that's happening downtown as well. So they want these establishments all to have Narcan available. And then this is wild. We also have an Aussie nonprofit that has come to Nashville called Red Frogs. And they're downtown now. And so I guess they have a frog that you'll see above, I don't know, a story high that you can go and get water or if you need help. They're, it's made up of trained volunteers. They're basically there to help reduce rates of sexual assault and any issues related with alcohol and drug use for the party goers. That's fascinating. We have also talked about having a nightmare in Las Vegas, obviously, but like this is just making me realize how well corralled we have our tourists. Like we don't see them. <laughs> yeah. They're on the strip. They barely go outside and they're very contained. I was about to ask, Sarah, since you and Nashville, like Las Vegas and Nashville seem to have a large uh, tourist population, like if it affected your daily life because I remember at the height of Portland tourism, it was mainly the breweries that people were coming for. So it was all that like peddling and Mm. it was really annoying. No, (laughs) we don't do that because people can walk between the casinos. I mean, literally talk Mm. to someone who's been to Las Vegas. They'll tell you they've never been off the strip. And in a way, it's like super. You stay there. You spend your money. Thank you. Goodbye. If if there's a way for people to act a fool in Vegas while drinking, I mean, there there are the pedal little devices that kind of cloud our streets too. So uh, we don't mitigate the damage as much. And it doesn't <laughs> sound like anyone's really trying to lower the consumption of of the, uh, nah. the the drinks and the drugs, just trying to deal with the aftermath. Yeesh. Most of it's confined to our entertainment district, which is also known as Lower Broadway. So that's right downtown in a historic area of town. Actually, I just have to mention, so we have the World War Theater here in Nashville, okay? So the, the famous World War Theater that we all know from the Civil Rights Movement where students staged lunch counter sit-ins in the 1960s is now home to Thunder from Down Under, the Australian Mail Review. So basically, Nashville's been taken over by Australians, is what you're... <laughs> yeah, I know, <laughs> that's actually, that's saying. true. <laughs> I just want people to know Nashville, it is amazing. My mom wanted me to make sure that, like, I'm not just shitting on Nashville. I love Nashville. I love going downtown. I love drinking, by the way. But uh, there's so much more to our city. The music side of it is absolutely amazing. Um, There's just so much more than just pedal taverns, okay? (laughs) All right, let's go to Houston to bring us home. Raheel Ramzanali 
the host of CityCast Houston. You have an enormous school district. I don't know if it's the biggest in the country, one of the biggest in the country. And the state of Texas has taken it over. Yeah, it is the biggest here in the state for sure. And we're dealing with one of the biggest experiments in public education right now in the country. It's been a year since the Texas Education Agency stepped in and got rid of the elected school board and superintendent and then put in their own superintendent and outside board of managers in the Houston Independent School District, also known as HISD, all because, get ready for this, one high school had a failing state rating out of 274 schools that make up HISD. And here's the kicker. By the time the state takeover happened last year, that high school had already improved, but the state still came in and installed Mike Miles as a superintendent. And Mike Miles, he's a former army ranger that has run charter schools in Colorado. And the first thing he did, he put into place a controversial education plan at struggling schools that focuses more on test scores and not real learning, according to teachers. Now, did this plan help improve test scores? Yes, it did. In fact, many schools saw an improvement, but the cost has been a record number of teachers leaving and principals resigning. So a lot of schools have lost stability and experience. And the newest wrinkle to all of this, which we're closely covering here at CityCast Houston, is that the new state appointed superintendent, Mike Miles, wants Houston voters to pass the largest school bond in the history of Texas. We're talking $4.4 billion to rebuild and improve school buildings and technology, but there's a core group of parents and teachers who are actively campaigning against it. And get this, there's not much Republicans and Democrats can agree on, but both parties have come out against the bond. So that's uniting everyone here in the city of Houston. Why are people in the city united against the bond. I would have thought there would be enthusiasm to fund schools and rebuild probably poor infrastructure. It's because of Mike Miles. There's not much trust when it comes to Mike Miles. He has made a lot of communication errors. He's very, you know, army-like in that it's my way or the highway. He hasn't been very receptive to people's opinions and concerns from parents and teachers. So it's all because of this one superintendent that the state put in place. But you're right. Like this bond is a good thing. It's going to help improve schools, especially struggling schools. But everyone is just united against Mike Miles. When they took over the district to begin with, was that a political move? Was it, man, that these Democrats can't run the school district and it was the Republicans in the state legislature and the Republicans in the governor's office who, who thought we're going to show them how it's done in the Republican way. That's what everyone assumed. But this is a nonpartisan thing, right? Like the state agency, the education agency is nonpartisan. So there wasn't any like, oh, the Democrats are ruining this. But yeah, there are underlying tones of that. And that's what everyone assumed. Mike Miles has never said anything about his political affiliations, has never endorsed anybody. He just truly cares about the students and the process of improving these schools. That's really interesting. Conspiracy corner. Go for it. Claudia Mesa, Portland here. <laughs> I would imagine this, like, I would just be like, this was the plan all along. You know, they just wanted the schools defunded and they they picked the right guy for everybody hate. Like, that's where my brain would go to immediately. But it sounds like you're seeing... Uh, more nuance than that. But are there any other conspiracy corners? There aren't many conspiracy corners here. Now, funding why schools are actually dropping with funding, not because of Mike Miles, not because of, you know, this conspiracy that, no, we have to defund the schools. It's just that students are leaving HISD, whether it be because of the state takeover, because charter schools out here might offer them a better education, private schools as well. But HISD did drop 5% when it came to enrollment this year, and that's a lot of money. It still falls underneath the, the conspiracy corner. I'm just saying, right here, it's not I hope that's talking a itself new feature, out of it. conspiracy that's corner. What, yeah, the bug is the feature. In Denver, our enrollment is declining everywhere for various reasons. I think the charter, I mean, the, the charter takeover infiltration is definitely happening. But um, a lot of folks are having to move out of the city because it's too expensive. And with them, the kids are going and there's just less kids here. And we closed, I think, eight schools last year. They're going to close a dozen more. And we're, we're, we're not a city that's declining. So it's definitely happening here and it, people are not happy about it. Thanks for joining us on CityCast USA and hearing about some 
local issues that may be what your city is talking about in a few months. If you have friends or family living in another CityCast hub, please tell them about the great podcast in their hometown. We'll be back tomorrow with a regular episode of your local CityCast. Till then, goodbye. Bye, y'all. Bye, Bye, besties. Bye, America. Bye. Bye. Since we taped this, Trump followed through on this vow to visit Aurora, holding a rally at a hotel and convention center there on Friday, October 11th. And a reminder that our fall campaign is underway. Become a CityCast Denver member and get good feelings and great perks. Go to membership.citycast.fm right now to join. If you're already a member, thank you. We could not do this work without you.